I would like to call on the dais, uh, Goral Gandhi. I will give a brief introduction about Goral Gandhi. Uh, Goral Gandhi has been the laboratory director of Rotunda, the Center for Human Reproduction, since uh, its inception in, in year 2000. She obtained a master's degree in applied biology from King Edward Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, Mumbai University in 1992 for her thesis on external and internal quality control in laboratories. Her research activities are geared towards developing innovative culture and cryopreservation methodologies to improve clinical pregnancy outcome. Current research projects are focused on fertility preservation in female patients through egg banking and uh, application of latest vitrification methods to improve and enhance treatment outcomes. Now, Goral Gandhi will talk on a very sensitive issue, that is, can we make IVF safer with a good vitrification program? Goral Gandhi. The title of my talk today is, Can We Make IVF Safer with a Good Vitrification Program? So the question is, is IVF safe? safe? The good news is that it is basically a safe process. We have been doing it for now over 35 years without any major problems and it has become a familiar routine. So it is a fairly safe process. But the not quite so good news is that we have certain risks which are associated with IVF. The first and the most uh, risk is the high multiple pregnancy rate. Then we have the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And I think the focus of everybody concerned with IVF, the patients as well as the clinicians, the laboratories, is on more on success over safety, which is wrong. Now, in the last decade or 15 years, many centers are using vitrification. As vitrification technologies have improved their success profiles, new applications seem to have emerged, making IVF treatments more successful and flexible. Today in my lecture, I'm going to talk about how vitrification can make IVF more safe. There are three areas where vitrification can play a key role in making IVF a safer process. The ultimate aim of any ART procedure is the birth of a single live healthy baby, which can be achieved through an elective single embryo transfer. So consequently, if we want to move towards a single embryo transfer, we must have a very reliable crowd preservation program available. Thus, we can use vitrification to prevent multiple pregnancies. We can use vitrification to prevent ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And vitrification in conjunction with minimal stimulation can offer much safer and gentler approach to IVF for our patients. So first, let us see about how vitrification can prevent multiple pregnancies. Now, we need to be aware of the drawbacks of transferring multiple embryos at a time. The main drawback of transferring multiple embryos is, of course, multiple pregnancies. But we must also remember that when we are transferring multiple embryos, we are also wasting embryos. Now, I think today, in 2013, 35 years after the first IVF baby was born, we need to reassess and rethink what we consider as a successful IVF outcome. Our aim is to maximize the chances of our patients to deliver a single live healthy baby and not just a positive pregnancy test. Triplet babies who spend months in the NICU and who might land up with lifelong complications is no longer considered as a successful IVF outcome. So how can we reduce multiple pregnancies when we are creating so many embryos? Of course, the obvious answer is to reduce the number of embryos that we transfer. That brings us to another question. Why do we transfer more embryos? I think it has a lot to do with expectations. Patient's expectations, clinic's expectations in terms of its pregnancy rates, the lab quality, and available cryopreservation technology. So what do patients want? I think patients want the best chance to achieve a pregnancy every time that they try. And many of these patients have been dealing with that uh, in their infertility for a long time. And they feel that if they can have two babies in one attempt, that is perfect. 
all their infertility problems are solved for life. So, what can we do? We have to explain them the concept of cumulative pregnancy rates. The practice of transferring more embryos also depends on our lab quality and the available crop preservation technology. Now, let's say I have five oocytes and my lab is a disaster. Then what is the point of growing these five oocytes up to blastocyst and trying to crowd preserve them? In order to maximize our success rates, we try and transfer all the available embryos in one attempt. But if we learn to grow our oocytes up to blastocyst, if we improve our lab quality, if we have a good crowd preservation program available, then we need not transfer so many embryos. Now, when we talked about drawbacks of transferring more embryos, we also said about embryo wastage. Now, let's say I have five good grade embryos and we are transferring these five embryos into the same patient in the same cycle. Now, for some reason, if the endometrium is not good or if that particular transfer process is a difficult transfer, then what are we doing? We are wasting all the five embryos. Now, if the embryos are good, if the endometrium is perfect and it's a good transfer process, then the patient might end up with very high order multiple pregnancy. And again, we are wasting embryos. So what can we do? We can transfer these five embryos at five different times. So if the patient does not get pregnant in the first attempt, she has a chance to get pregnant in a second attempt, third attempt, or a fourth attempt. And the cumulative pregnancy rate from these five different attempts is higher than transferring all the five embryos in one attempt. Now, patients are not ignorant, but they are not scientists. And many a times they rely on us to take decisions for them. So it is our responsibility to explain them this concept of cumulative pregnancy rates. Now, this is a Cochrane database systemic review comparing the results of a single embryo transfer and a double embryo transfer. Now, as you can see, the live birth rate when two embryos were transferred is much higher than when one embryo was transferred. But so was the multiple pregnancy rate. The multiple pregnancy rate with a single embryo transfer is almost 0%, whereas multiple pregnancy rate with double embryo transfer is 32%. Now, in the same review, the authors compared the results of a double embryo transfer with two single embryo transfers, one fresh and one frozen. And the live birth rate with double embryo transfer and the cumulative success rate of two single embryo transfers were similar, but the multiple pregnancy rate with the approach of transferring one embryo at a time in two different attempts, the multiple pregnancy rate was negligible. Now, this is another paper comparing the live birth rate between double embryo transfer and triple embryo transfer, and it was concluded that there was no difference in the success rates whether two embryos were transferred or three embryos were transferred, but the multiple pregnancy rate was much, much higher when three embryos were transferred. So what can we do? We have to offer alternatives to transferring multiple embryos, alternatives like blastocyst culture and reliable cryopreservation technology. So what is the goal of a successful cryopreservation program? It must ensure high survival after thawing, and it must ensure high viability, high implantation, and development after thawing. Now, traditionally, slow freezing protocols have been used to freeze all kinds of human gametes. But clinically satisfactory results have not been obtained. Furthermore, the results are not consistent. On the other hand, vitrification after ICSI is the best tool in recent times to improve our clinical pregnancy rates. There are many papers and tremendous supporting evidence to prove this. We are using Crowtec vitrification to freeze all our embryos. We have a survival rate of 98.6% with our embryos. So now with survival rate of over 98%, we are very confident that we will get back whatever embryos that we freeze. So it now starts to make sense to transfer only one or two embryos, freeze the rest, and perform more and more frozen embryo transfers. 
Now let us look at vitrification as an approach to prevent ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. OHSS is a potentially life-threatening iatrogenic complication of IVF resulting from the excessive use of gonadotropins. A variety of preventive strategies have been adopted to reduce the risk of OHSS, but none of these methods have consistently demonstrated efficacy in preventing the syndrome except for the cancellation of the cycle before HCG administration. Although cycle cancellation is the most effective and safest approach, it is obviously frustrating and costly for the patients, and a second attempt of ovarian stimulation may lead to the same risk. So another approach to reduce the OHHS risk has been introduced, consisting of the elective cryopreservation of all available embryos and postponing the embryo transfer. Avoiding fresh embryo transfer minimizes further exposure to HCG and gives the patients a chance to conceive from the frozen embryos. Uh, this is a paper examining the efficacy of uh, vitrification for OHSS. They had uh, studied 24 patients. The survival rate of the embryos was 97%. They transferred 2.8 embryos per patient and obtained clinical pregnancy rate of 41.6%. This is another paper where they have uh, reported clinical pregnancy rate of 80% and implantation rate of 39.5%. So I wanted to look at our data to see if we could actually reproduce these findings. We had 42 patients who were identified at a risk of developing severe OHSS. The criteria for high-risk high patients for serum estradiol levels more than 4,500 picograms per ml or more than 15 follicles measuring greater than 16 mm. On an average, we collected 17.5 oocytes per patient and 12.4 embryos per patient. All these embryos were frozen and there were no fresh embryo transfer for these patients. We thawed an average of 2.8 embryos for each frozen embryo transfer cycle and we transferred 2.5 embryo and the clinical pregnancy rate was 66.6%. And most importantly, none of these patients developed severe OHSS. So obviously, this approach works extremely well in our hands, and it is very effective for selected women undergoing IVF who are at a risk of developing OHSS. Now, vitrification and minimal stimulation. Gentle ovarian stimulation protocols, known as mini-IVF or minimal stimulation IVF, have been thought to produce less eggs but eggs of higher quality and be easier on the patient. Many studies have evaluated the efficacy of mild, low-cost, minimal stimulation protocols paired with vitrification. And routine IVF is slowly being challenged by simpler and more cost-effective methodologies. These include natural cycle IVF, minimal stimulation, and IVF light, which is minimal stimulation IVF, vitrification and accumulation of embryos, and a remote embryo transfer. Now, this is a study from Dr. John Zeng's group. They mainly perform minimal stimulation cycles at their center. It is a retrospective data analysis of patients who underwent minimal stimulation protocols. All the embryos were vitrified at the blastocyst stage the frozen embryos were thawed and transferred in a subsequent cycle. A total of 202 patients from all age groups underwent 249 single embryo transfers, resulting in 43.5% clinical pregnancies. And this is the bifurcation as per age, and for patients under 35 years of age, they got a clinical pregnancy rate of 54.3%, and for patients between 38 and 40 years of age, 30% clinical pregnancy rate. For patients over 40 years, 21.1% pregnancy rate. So the results have demonstrated that very favorable pregnancy rates can be achieved for all age groups with gentle stimulation paired with vitrification. Now this is another paper from the same group where they've compared the results of minimal stimulation with fresh and frozen embryo transfers. It is a retrospective data analysis of patients who underwent minimal ovarian stimulation protocols. Fresh as well as frozen embryo transfers were performed. 
the fro frozen embryos were thawed and transferred in subsequent cycle. A total of 1,503 single embryo transfers were performed. And they got a clinical pregnancy rate of 41% with frozen embryo transfers and 20% with fresh embryo transfer. And it was a clinical, a statistically significant difference. And clinical pregnancy rate for patients under 35 years of age was 47.7%, again, statistically much higher than fresh embryo transfers. And the authors concluded that milder approaches to IVF give lower pregnancy rates per started cycle if only fresh embryo transfers are considered. And minimal stimulation is unthinkable without a reliable vitrification program. Now, as uh, Sakina presented our results yesterday, we have been performing IVF light since last two years for treating poor responders and now all many other groups of patients. Uh, women with a poor ovarian reserve who commonly do not respond to heavy stimulation are left with few options when planning a family. One such option is embryo banking with a minimal stimulation IVF protocol. This approach allows women to have consecutive cycles before the follicular reserve is depleted. It will maximize the ovaries already limited lifespan, allowing patients the opportunity to store embryos while oocyte production is still active. Results suggest that the efficacy of this approach for patients who would normally be counseled for donor egg IVF. We have been practicing IVF light with minimal stimulation and embryo banking since past two years. And this is an analysis of our results, which we actually already saw yesterday. And So we have had a clinical pregnancy rate of almost 35% for poor responders with IVF light compared to about 15% with conventional IVF per embryo transfer. Now these poor responder patients are patients where only three or four embryos are there. It is all that we get and they are very, very precious embryos. We have to try all that we can to ensure that we get pregnancies out of these embryos. So a very, very efficient vitrification program is extremely essential and critical to minimize embryo loss. So we have found cryotech vitrification with its many advantages and significant improvements over all prior methods to be a very efficient method of vitrification. Over the last two decades, cryobiologists have worked very hard to achieve higher and higher survival rates. Many strategies have been developed to minimize cell damage. Now, for successful vitrification, showing in mathematical terms, if we can increase the cooling and warming rates, we can have big success. And for increasing cooling and warming rates, we have to decrease the volume. This is one of the most important strategies to successful vitrification. In addition, the high speed of cooling and warming can prevent chilling injuries that happen between 15 and minus 15 degrees centigrade, which harm the cytoplasmic lipid droplets and the meiotic spindles. And as all of us know, Dr. Kuwayama has been the master of vitrification. He has worked very hard for over the last 20 years to improve the vitrification method. This is a history of his vitrification, development of his vitrification methods, starting with 1991 with kettle blastocyst, moving on to kettle oocytes, porcine blastocyst, porcine oocytes, and cryotop method for oocytes embryos. And finally, in 2011, he has developed the newest cryotech method of vitrification, which is reported to have 100% survival rates for oocytes, embryos, and blastocyst. Significant improvements by adjustments of cryoprotectants have been made to reduce the toxicity of the solutions. We have already seen the advantages of cryotech vitrification yesterday, but again, just to briefly summarize, it has no added serum or protein, so there is no risk of serum derived virus contamination. It is a completely chemically defined solution. It contains a macromolecule called hydroxypropyl cellulose, which gives optimal viscosity, providing better resistance to damage during storage and warming. And it contains trehalose instead of sucrose, which is used in most other vitrification solutions. 
the cryotech plate has a groove for the cryotech where the cryotech sits in this groove and the, while loading the focus of the embryo remains the same when it is being washed in the vitrification well and when it is being loaded on the cryotech tip. So this gives a great ease of handling to the entire process. Now as we know vitrification is a highly skilled oriented process and there is a lot of in the same laboratory many a times we feel uh, we see a lot of difference in variation between performers and embryologists. But with cryotech vitrification the ease of handling is great so there is you see much less person to person variation with cryotech vitrification. Now it has been proved that high warming rate is even more crucial to survival and post warm development than high cooling rate. The warming plate of the cryotech system has a warm well which is incorporated into the plate which uh, gives very very high warming rates. The system can be used as an open method as well as a closed method. So now for last 20 years, scientists could not cryopreserve oocytes and could not even cryopreserve embryos with some, such high survival rates. But now anyone, any laboratory can cryopreserve it and with over 99% survival rates using these new methods. We at Rotunda have been organizing uh, regular live hands-on vitrification workshops and we have now trained over 80 embryologists not only from India but also from USA, Australia, Singapore, Nigeria, Turkey and even during training we have not come across a single embryologist who has killed an oocyte or an embryo even during training. So I think the message given here is very loud and clear that this is a very safe protocol and uh, it gives extremely high survival rates if it is performed correctly and if it is performed, the protocol is followed thoroughly. There are certain tips which we must remember while vitrification. Because almost all cryoprotectants are toxic, it is important to watch the duration of exposure to the final cryoprotectant very carefully before plunging it into liquid nitrogen. Minimize the volume of the vitrification solution as much as possible. This can be achieved by using the right size diameter micropipette. Because, of the, because the volume of the solution on the tip is very small, there is a danger of evaporation. If the vitrification solution gets evaporated, then the toxicity of the cryoprotectants will increase. To prevent this, it is important to plunge the cryotech into liquid nitrogen as soon as possible after loading. Submerge the cryotech loaded with the, the, with the cells directly in liquid nitrogen by passing very quickly through the damaging vapor phase. This will avoid chilling injuries which happen between 15 and minus 15 degrees centigrade. High warming rates are crucial to embryo survival. Keep the cryotech submerged in liquid nitrogen very, very close to your workstation. Ensure that your thawing solution is at 37 degrees and very quickly plunge the cryotech into thawing solution. If this, is, this step is performed within one second, then you can achieve warming rates of about 42,000 degrees centigrade per minute. So, and vitrification is all about speed, so be very efficient in all the steps and follow the protocol thoroughly. It is again a highly skill oriented process and close adherence to the protocol cannot be overemphasized. These methods are developed by scientists with years and years of painstaking research and we must follow the protocol thoroughly if we want to achieve uh, results as they are published in rich literature. So in conclusion, vitrification makes it possible to maintain high cumulative pregnancy rates while avoiding multiple pregnancies. Elective cryopreservation of all embryos by vitrification gives excellent pregnancy rates in subsequent frozen embryo transfer cycles and it completely eliminates the risk of severe OHSs. Embryo banking with a minimal stimulation IVF protocol is an effective way of completing families for women with poor ovarian reserve who would otherwise have to go for donor egg IVF. So to answer the question that we started with, can we make IVF safer with a good vitrification program? Yes, we can definitely do that. We have a very efficient method and right protocol for vitrification now available. And I do believe that it is an extremely powerful tool at our disposal, which is changing the way we practice. And we have to ensure that we use this tool 
to its fullest potential and offer a more safe and more efficient IVF program to our patients. Thank you.